If you're having any technical problems, please send them via chat to UC Santa Barbara or UCSB virtual events staff. And Percy, if we're clear, are we clear to, to we're do We're clear the... to record. Okay, thank you for allowing us to record today's event. So it is my pleasure now to hand over the program and introduce Charlie Hale, our Sage Sarah Miller McCune Dean of Social Sciences. Thank you. And thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's my great pleasure to echo Nicole's welcome uh, to this, to this uh, premier Feminist Futures event. Uh, Feminist Futures Initiative is one of our uh, highest priorities in the division, and I can't imagine um, uh, a better way to highlight um, the exciting uh, goals and principles and, and potential of of the Feminist Futures Initiative than this intergenerational dialogue between Kristen Hall and Shivani Awasti. I want to, uh, it's a wonderful uh, gathering of, uh, see if I can do my view to make sure I see everyone. Uh, wonderful gathering of, uh, of friends of, of UC Santa Barbara and the Division of Social Sciences and of the Feminist Studies Department. Uh, I want to give a especially warm welcome to, to Arti Awasti, uh, who, who uh, you may note some, some similarity in last name to the speaker. We're so proud. RT as a, uh, as a Dean's cabinet member uh, has been a wonderful supporter of our, of our uh, endeavors in the social sciences. We also, I believe, have Laura, Laura Cohen, who's a Dean's cabinet member, Lori Konsker, uh, uh, Blair Hall, and Phil White. Uh, Phil Blair, and Ava Holler, who's also here with us today, uh, and Lori Konsker are all also trustees of the foundation. And I wanna give a, 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 a brief shout out to Ava, who, who actually in an early conversation, just as COVID was getting started, was the, the wonderful inspiration for this idea of virtual salons, which then she's taken to some amazing level in her own, in her own endeavors. And Ava, we're so glad to have you here uh, in the virtual salon of feminist uh, futures. Thank you, Charlie. <clears throat> it's a privilege to be here with you. Um, and also a, a special uh, recognition um, to our trustee and Dean's cabinet member, uh, Blair Hall, who's been a wonderful supporter of feminist studies department and who's the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the person responsible for the first chair in women's studies um, created in the whole UC system, which is held by Eileen Boris, who's also here present. So welcome to all of you. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dean Lila Roop, who's uh, the initiator and leader of the Feminist Futures Initiative. She used to be a few months ago, Associate Dean in the Division of Social Sciences. She was whisked away to become Interim Dean of Graduate Studies. Uh, we, we miss her, but are thrilled by her new position and particularly thrilled by the fact that her first condition in accepting the job of Dean was to, uh, was to get full guarantees from the, the powers that be that Feminist Futures Initiative would continue to be uh, among her highest priorities, even though the deanship is very demanding. And that certainly has been the case. And Lila, we're absolutely deeply grateful to you for your uh, leadership and your vision in, in making the Feminist Futures Initiative a reality. So with that, um, Lila. <clears throat> Thank you, Charlie. Um, welcome to all of you. It's really terrific to, um, to see, well, sort of see so many people here. And I just want to say a word about the um, whole Feminist Futures Initiative, which is familiar, I think, to most of you. Um, the, the Feminist Futures Initiative is devoted to building a center of collaborative, interdisciplinary, intergenerational, intersectional research and dialogue that is public facing and that will make a difference in bringing about a more just future. So we're really planning to build on the strength that we have already at UCSB um, across the university in uh, research on gender and sexuality and feminist studies. And our, our goal is to establish this center. And we've been working on this for a couple of years, um, thanks to Blair Hull, who helped us with the first two years of our programming. We've been modeling the kind of 
programs that we, uh, that we want to see when the center is actually in place. And we do have a commitment from the university to hire a director of the center. So I will be looking forward to handing over my role as organizer to a new faculty member. And we hope that this will happen soon. And we've also been, so we've been working on campus, but we've also been working with a number of people who are here today, friends of the university who are really supporters of this whole um, project. And so this is the, this is, this idea really came out of that group that we would have these intergenerational dialogues. And I do have to credit Charlie for this initial pairing because he came up with the idea and he was so right. Um, once I met Kristen and uh, Shivani, I knew that this was going to be an absolutely fabulous um, discussion. So without further ado, let me introduce our speakers. And um, as, as you saw before, we'll have a conversation for about 30 minutes, and um, then we'll be open to questions, which you can raise your virtual or real hand or um, put in a chat, and we will, um, we will go from there. So uh, Kristen Hull is an activist, socially conscious impact and gender lens investor. All of those are descriptions of the kind of investor she is, and you will learn more about what that actually means if you don't already know. She has her PhD from Berkeley in education. We forgive her for not having actually gone to school here, but she's gonna tell us a little bit about her connection to the university. Um, she's the founder and CEO of NIA Global Solutions, a co-founder of Hub Oakland, and she's committed to hiring and training women and people of color in sustainable and transformative investing. Um, she's also committed to community activism around education and environmental sustainability. In addition, she is a money doula. And uh, well, I, I think we'll hear some more about that. Um, in this context, she provides information, education, and support at any point in one's journey to align their assets with their personal values. Um, so we're delighted to have her for this inaugural dialogue. She's exactly the kind of person that uh, we know is going to help us make a better feminist future. Shivani Awasti is a fourth year economics major, a French minor, and also pursuing the technology management program certificate. So she keeps herself quite busy. Uh, she's an economics peer advisor, a communi the communications and marketing director for the Associated Students Office of the Controller, and an officer of budgeting and special funding for the Thriving Initiative, a nonprofit founded at UC Santa Barbara. Like Kristen, she is uh, a busy woman. Um, as you will see, she is a totally amazing example of uh, what Feminist Futures is all about, which is our hope for the future. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Shivani, who is going to kind of lead in this conversation. Thank you for that introduction, Layla. You definitely did Kristen justice and were too kind to appreciate that. Um, I also want to preface this by saying my Wi-Fi it's probably because I'm having some issues with my Wi-Fi, just as a heads up. I'd love to hear more about your history campus, UCSB, and a little more about your relationship with Feminist Futures Initiative. Kristen, you're muted. I just realized that. Thank you. <laughs> I have um, a dog named Stella who wants to be in the feminist futures. And so she has been um, letting herself known. So I was trying to protect you all from her. Um, thank you all for gathering today. Uh, well, there aren't many places we can be. There are lots of Zoom rooms we could be in now. So I'm recognizing that and appreciating the um, the enthusiasm for this and um, for for what is a feminist future and for tuning in to, to hear this dialogue and and I'm humbled and privileged to be here and um, with my dad, who is my connection to UC Santa Barbara. Uh, I also have a son who has started there and may continue there um, in the future and um, I really grew up in the summers on the campus at UC Santa Barbara. So that was, um, we did family camp. Both of my parents are alums, as are aunts and uncles and cousins and, um, and godparents. And so uh, 
really, I always thought I didn't attend as an undergraduate because I really thought my future was at UC Santa Barbara. And so may there be a future for me in some academic department. Uh, it, it certainly feels like home and feels like family. And um, when my dad was in a position to make a significant gift, um, it was really the sisters uh, and, and myself who said, you know, hey, um, let's earmark that. And he said, I, I just got to get the money out the door. I, I'm so proud of my alma mater and, and these things. And we had some discussions and um, he was open to earmarking a gift um, in memory of his mother. And I think also for his daughters, he certainly listened to us when we said, you know, we really want this going to something values aligned. And so then it wasn't too many discussions later where he decided to do um, this chair, you know, and so of course to step into something that is so values aligned and I think, you know, um, his legacy fe feels really exciting. So, so that's where we are today and my history and, and hopefully more connections uh, to this movement. Yeah, I, uh, values aligned missions are so, so important. And um, actually, that's exactly part of the reason why I wanted to talk to you today. Um, I was hoping you could tell the audience a little bit more about NIA Impact Investing and how you initially entered the realm of impact investing and also just define what exactly that is for the audience. Sure, sure. So thank you. And it's, um, I would say it's a topic of our time, um, particularly when we're talking about our feminist futures. And so for me, impact investing really is just taking a moment to be a conscious investor. And it means um, being conscious of and connecting the dots between where our money is invested, whether we're banking um, or whether we're in the stock market or in private investments and connecting the dots between what our dollars are doing um, and um, the world that we live in and the economy that we are, because I, I, I'm pretty clear that every dollar we are either spending, investing, or banking is creating the economy and the world that we live in. And so being really conscious about directing our dollars with, um, with our values and with the world that we want to see. And so when it comes to feminist futures, um, are we investing into companies that recognize that we need a balance in our economy? And so how are they recognizing that and what policies and procedures do they have in place um, to have a balanced economy that's going to benefit everybody? And so not only, um, you know, sometimes being a being a white woman, it sounds like I'm really advocating for more women in leadership. Well, maybe I am. And yet, why, why is that? You know, because um, the diversity shows that companies make better decisions up to 87% of the time when um, there's a diverse team making those decisions. And so that's a place I think I'm advocating for our men as much as I'm advocating for our women to say, you know, let's share some of this load uh, of leadership. And what does it mean to bring, um, bring that diversity? So in companies that we're investing into or banks that we're thinking about, for me, that means um, are the loans going to women entrepreneurs, women-owned businesses, um, and what percentage of loans? And this is something we can ask all of our banks. There needs to be transparency in this. Um, our local banks honestly do a better job at this type. That's actually part of their business model rather than bidding for large pipelines for um, extraction projects internationally, our local banks are tasked at keeping money locally in local communities. And so um, is the money going to um, women led businesses. Um, and then, of course, at the leadership level, um, who's in e the executive C suite, um, who's on the board and who's and and I would say for a feminist future, we want to see all sorts of diversity. So that also means people of color from different backgrounds. You know, I think bringing that diversity of thought and background to our decision making table is is one piece of what we're talking about here. Yeah, definitely. Thank you um, for that super, super comprehensive answer. I um, mean, it actually segues perfectly into one of my next questions. Um, so you have chosen to play a leadership role in financial feminism with Mia. So I was wondering if you could name some of the ways that you've aided people of color specifically and how you think being a cisgender white female in the space as opposed to perhaps POC or someone who isn't cisgender has affected your experience. 
Oh, sure. Well, so um, that's a big question. It sounds like a very straightforward question, and yet there's a lot behind that. And so um, let's see. So Nia means intention and purpose. And so we're using intention and purpose into every decision and every investment. And so what does it mean to be advocating for um, people of color during this time? Um, one of the ways we do that is by choosing companies um, into the NIA Global Solutions portfolio that are working on some of these issues. So whether that means financial inclusion, where that hasn't happened before, that, that's something we're definitely thinking about, both for women and for previously marginalized communities. Um, it also uh, happens in our healthcare. You know, so this pandemic that we're living in, one of the reasons that the NIA Global Solutions portfolio is so well positioned is because I've been thinking about healthcare both for women and for other populations for a long time. And, and partly that's me bringing my full self to this. I, uh, my first W2 was at um, a florist. Um, and so I really grew up in the gay community in the 80s in San Francisco. and. I lived through what I considered a pandemic at that time that maybe wasn't globally recognized and that was HIV and AIDS. So I've thought about who gets access to healthcare and who doesn't, you know, since I was a teenager. And so many of our companies are working on um, not only a vaccine for HIV, um, but also, you know, uh, uh, for many viruses around the world. And so also, what does it mean to have a vaccine for Zika. Um, one of our companies is actively working on that. Will they make a lot of money doing that? Maybe not. Are they going to be well positioned for um, people on this planet that don't have access to those kinds of diseases and those kinds of things or things we think about? Also sickle cell, um, really important in the Black community. So be thinking of products and services. Um, that are beneficial to everybody in our economy is one way we think about it. Um, then when we're having conversations with every company in our portfolio, we're actually asking them about, um, I would say, let me back up to say about 50% of the companies in our portfolio made a statement for Black Lives Matter. Um, our conversations with every company now start with, um, we'll uh, get to know you and, you know, how we're values aligned and how we're thinking about the UN Sustainable Development Goals and how we see them achieving those and where they're working for them. We're also talking specifically about race relations in the US when it comes to corporate America and what we see them as their platform in, in being able to do. So one of the things that we're, we're talking about with companies are best practices with diversity and inclusion. And one of them is if you made a statement about Black Lives Matter, um, what are you doing both internally within your company and then also in the community to really show that Black Lives Matter and why this is important um, both for your own employees as well as for the world. And so really educating companies on how they can use their platform to make change. Um, if they did not make a statement for Black Lives Matter, the conversation is pretty similar. Um, given that you didn't make a statement, what are you doing both internally for your own employees um, and externally in your community to show that Black Lives Matter? Um, and so also showing them just transparency about where to put it on their website. Um, uh, many of you know we're also activists about forced arbitration because that has been highly associated with both sexual harassment and racial discrimination. So talking to companies, they don't all know the, um, how these practices can be affected. So showing them the research, helping them connect the dots, and then helping them be better advocates for their employees and then also in their hiring process for bringing on more um, diversity. Yeah, um, and actually I've never thought about what companies who didn't receive, what, um, release a statement in support of BLM, what they might be doing behind the scenes. So that is definitely an interesting perspective and one I will be taking into account too now when I look into companies that I'm, you know, looking to work for in the future, see if they have any clear action items, what exactly they're doing, or if it's just a statement and, you know, performative activism. Um, so also kind of rewinding a little bit, I wanted to know, um, how you define feminism and what financial feminism means to you. 
Okay, so this is a loaded question. There's a lot of there's it some, is. yes, and so and for our beautiful white men um, on this call, you know, one just thank you for being in this dialogue because it, feminism can be a loaded term. Um, what does it really mean? And I think there's other people on this call that are are much uh, uh, better. I guess, situated both academically, intellectually, and activist-wise to answer that. And so I'll just answer from where, where I see this is I'm really looking for balance, um, both of power, I'll name it, you know, power, decision makers, um, and then also particularly because we are talking about feminism in our finances, um, directing dollars to where they need to go. And so can that happen from the white male seat? Absolutely. So we're looking for the white men to be part of this balance, you know, and to be holding the situation where it's not beneficial to anybody to have our world, our economy, nature, our ecology out of balance. Um, nature's telling us that now with the, the storms, the smoke, the hurricanes, um, and I think our economy is telling that to us as well. So can we be more in balance? And so uh, who is a feminist? Someone that's going to speak out and, and name what is the status quo and where do we need to get to to be in balance? Yeah, thank you. Um, and actually, I asked a few of my housemates, I live with a few other people all around my age, what feminism means to them. And across the board, it seemed like people didn't describe feminism as just through that gender binary. It was about fighting and creating equality and a good life for everyone, regardless of, you know, socioeconomic status, gender, race, ethnicity, whatever it may be. So I think you're absolutely right. It really does go down to the people in power currently, which just happens to be the white cis male for a majority of these large corporations. Um, we see it in our government. It does come down to them. Um, it also leads to the question though, many of my peers kind of question the possibility of reconciling capitalism with ideals of social justice like feminism and financial feminism due to the fact that capitalism is kind of, you know, in power of that white male. So how do you believe you're able to make the two work together with impact investing? You know, I think capitalism um, is is a problematic term um, and it's a problematic practice i'll just say so what does it mean <clears throat> um you know we have the verb to capitalize on um and can you capitalize on your talents can you capitalize on things and so in this case um i think what i have issue with is making money by any means possible um and also that we we have this idea that market forces are efficient um, efficient for what, right? So I think we just have to unpack it a little bit. I think that being an entrepreneur in our society is, you know, that's something that Americans do where we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we um, go out and, you know, could do a social enterprise or any enterprise and, and that's our capitalist system. And so um, I think it's really just unwrapping and unveiling what do we mean by that and then who has access. So um, that's part of the problem is is can we really provide access to everybody and are we when it comes to investing are we missing out on some entrepreneurs be them women or other um um other i guess i'll say overlooked entrepreneurs because they don't look like what a silicon valley entrepreneur looks like to us and there's we actually have enough too many studies that say that on the investor side, um, we are overlooking um, women uh, because we're women and that we don't. And so um, just can we be smarter investors by being more inclusive in who we, who we include in our capitalist system? I think the other part, um, and I mentioned this on the pre-call, I'll mention it to everyone, is that um, who's doing the allocating in this capital system is gonna be really important. And so the Knight Foundation commissioned Harvard um, in 2017 and then again in 2019 and they put out a study um, earlier this year about their work in asset management and women and people of color combined manage 1.3 percent of the 70 trillion assets and so when we're talking about a capitalist system that is run significantly by you know 98.3 uh, percent or excuse me 98.7 percent by one group 
Um, is that the capitalist system that America really talks about? I don't think so. You know, so we, for me, it means finding more balance. And then another piece of this that I'll just name is that our, our world as far as investment decisions has really moved toward indexing. And um, there was a piece of that that felt democratized because if you could get 500 companies, say the S&P 500, which are our largest companies, put them in one package, be that a mutual fund or an ETF, there is democratized access because the everyday investor with an ETF could be $25, $100, you know, a mutual fund can be $1,000, $2,000 entry point. You do have access to a diversified portfolio. And I think there were some really good intentions around that. Um, what it's caused over time, over the past three decades that we've moved to indexing is that nobody's driving the ship because our economy is organized in this very male oriented way, which is around size. So our indexes are based on our 500 largest companies and then maybe domicile US. Um, you could have like a mid cap, so medium sized companies in a global and yet to get into that index, we don't have enough eyes on that. Um, and so when all this money is flowing into an index, because that is our standard practice, we have a lot of money flowing into something that's not being watched by products and services, by practices, by inclusiveness, by who's running it, because we're not using those other criteria on how a company gets into an index. And so that's part of our problem that I think feminists um, are pretty good at connecting the dots about systems. And so that's why we need more feminists in our financial future is because selecting companies based on other criteria, such as what are their products and services, where is their revenue coming from, and then who is that diverse team making those decisions, we're gonna have a better future for everybody. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I also think your point of creating a balance is really important. Um, what I'm wondering is, as you know, I'm preparing to go into the workforce, my peers are preparing to go into the workforce, like, what can we do to not only help bring about that balance and keep these ideals in our mind, but also spread these ideals to other people so they become the new norm? Okay, well, I love that. And thank goodness we have this generation who's stepping up because um, one of the things about your generation that I so love and appreciate is you're already questioning. You already don't trust these systems that aren't working for everybody and you see that. And so being able to bring your whole self and um, I think the balance there is um, just knowing that many of us are doing the best that we can to try to sometimes it's hospice this old system while we're birthing the new um, and what's that space in between look like, you know, and you guys have heard this many of you, you know, when one door closes another door opens. It's the hallway that's a bitch. So we're in the hallway right now and you guys are the ones shepherding us through that and so bringing your full self bringing your curiosity bringing your sharp minds. And then I'm also finding that the world really does change one conversation at a time. So communication skills, the ability to listen um, is probably our most key um, skill and not to bring into politics, but we did see two candidates that neither one of them really um, at least decided to showcase that skill of listening. I think your generation really has that and is really honing that. So listening for what's happening, listening for what could happen, and then being able to um, assertively and not aggressively share your points of view. Um, another piece that I would say to your generation is um, you definitely can bring your values with you. So Sometimes, particularly women, um, are drawn to the nonprofit space um, because they want to do values aligned work. And what I would encourage is um, that you really can do values aligned work in any industry and that we need you to do that values aligned work and to bring that, whether it's on the sustainability side, whether it's for pushing for more gender diversity, um, but to just enter knowing that we need you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think that's a really good point too. I think, I know I definitely had the misconception like when I first started that the only way I can make a difference was through directly working with a nonprofit. But um, I think it's important to know that you can make a difference within large corporations too. Um, 
Speaking of, I was also looking at your Money Doula blog. That was something Layla mentioned briefly in the beginning. Um, Kristen does have a blog. I would highly recommend everyone take a look at it. It has a lot of good reads. And one thing that really interested me was your racial justice portfolios. I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about those as well. Sure, thank you. So, um, well, one, it's, you know, it's fun to write that. And I honestly, anytime I'm having an issue with the world or I want to have something I want to work out, or if I feel like there's a piece of news that they got wrong <laughs> and there's another, another perspective, they do just kind of pop out. And so, um, and actually I'll just highlight one, um, was it was Father's Day and I was really wanting to send the most love I could to my own father who's actually on this video, this uh, Zoom today. And I was having trouble expressing that. And because we do have differences and we, we do see the world differently, particularly when it comes to investing. And so I wrote out um, all of the things that I had learned from him and then also expressed why I needed to do things differently and, and what that meant. And so that is on that blog. Um, and it actually got picked up by the Wall Street Journal and they did their version of one generation to another about talking about um, investing differences. So I just highlight that because it's not just a Kristen and Blair issue, but it is a generational issue. And, um, and I, I'm working hard with the Money Doula blog, um, you know, to try to see how we can bring these generations together. Um, then as far as racial justice, um, it is um, the question of our time. It's the topic of our time. And I'm so grateful for that because the work we've been doing now, people are paying attention. So I also wrote, and I don't know if it's on the blog or if it's on our other website, I'll have to check, but I do have a, um, a guide for investors on racial equity investing. And um, I put that out, I think in May of this year, really due to people asking, what can we do? And I said, you know, directing money um, and decision making with a racial equity lens is what we can all do right now. So there's, I think, seven, you know, pretty simple things that organizations, families, um, to the extent sometimes individuals can do on their own and they're there. Um, and it really is just using that lens to be able to say, what is the status quo and how can we be doing better and how can we bring a lens for justice? Um, and so, you know, again, the community banks. There's an organization called C-Note, which I think has no minimum and you can direct money to women of color led businesses during this time. So there, there's some different things, um, some suggestions, but really, um, again, it's just bringing the balance and that when we reduce our inequalities, we're actually reducing our risks. Um, and we can do that on the climate side, we can do it on um, the racial justice side. And so it's really just bringing what, what's gonna be make sense for smart investments. And that's something I see. Amazing, yeah, thank you for explaining that more. Um, I was also wondering, I feel like you're doing so much great work both with Money Doula and with Nia Impact. So I was wondering if any of your peers in particular, any cisgender white males have reached out to you to talk to you about the work you're doing or where you see the most support from? You know, thank you. I would love to say that that's the way the world works. And um, it's not so much. And, and finance, I mean, I think all business is really, really competitive. Um, and um, we don't have enough white men reaching out to say, wow, I want to hear more or, or I could do that. I, I would, I'm just, you know, thank you to all the, the men that are on this call um, because you're here to learn more and you're here to be part of the dialogue. And I think we need more of that. Absolutely. I think the finance system is probably um, our most archaic. Um, it's, it's so status quo, it's so deeply ingrained in how, how we do America, um, and it's the most ripe to be disrupted. And we're gonna see some FinTech, you know, and we're already seeing that as far as disruptions. Um, we're certainly ripe for more equity to come in and, um, and the people that figure that out are really going to um, both benefit our society and benefit their pocketbooks. So, so my hope is that more people will be reaching out. I, I will say that we do do these calls, as I mentioned, with all of our companies, and um, that has been really encouraging. So um, before we were just this, you know, who is Nia, you know, woman-based asset management firm in Oakland, California, you know, 
and they, they wouldn't even answer our messages or our calls. And now we're getting firms put 11 people on the call. Um, this morning, the CEO of Moderna got on the call because they knew they could learn diversity and inclusion practices from us. So I would say there are men, particularly in corporate America, that are stepping up because they see this as the future and they do want to, particularly those companies that are growing, they want to grow in a way that's inclusive and they know they can learn that from us. So that, that's been exciting. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think um, we're definitely in the midst of a change right now. And I'm just hoping it's a change that continues and not one that is transient. So, you know, keeping my fingers crossed for that. Um, I have a question now focused more towards people on this call who are perhaps budding young entrepreneurs with ideas focused on financial feminism and sustainability and social justice who are maybe unsure about how to get access to investors and how to get people excited about their ideas. What would you recommend so they can get their foot in the door? Okay, so um, getting your foot in the door. It's, I, it's hard to give anybody um, uh, um, advice during this time when, you know, when hiring is so weird. And, you know, so I guess um, this is, I guess, for any industry and for anyone getting a job outside of COVID or during COVID is um, really looking how you can be of service. And I mentioned that knowing that not everybody can afford to work for free um, or to just say, hey, I'd love to do a project with you um, to get to know you kind of thing. Um, you know, and I, I want to make sure people are um, being paid what they deserve, particular young people. You know, I do think that the internship has become this kind of way for companies to get free labor. And so I'm not condoning that at all. I just know it's a common practice. And so those that are willing to, um, you know, connect, you know, social media is our friend. Certainly right now, you know, we are all available, you know, be it on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever, we, we are available to the extent we're checking that. And so, um, I think right now, and this is so I do have a son, I have two sons that are living through the pandemic right now and both need employment and um, and it's so hard to be your age because the people that are 10 years older that have 10 years of experience also need a job right now and they're willing to take the same job. So during this time, I just feel depressed and I want to be like, oh, here's the answer. This is what you do. Um, but um, there are, you know, some of the large firms do have entry level positions, you know, the, the Wells Fargo's and the JP Morgan's and the Goldman Sachs, and they do have um, both summer positions and others, and, they, and they're still hiring during these times. Um, smaller firms as well. Um, and so really, I guess just maybe the LinkedIn and just messaging people um, as far as getting the foot in the door. Um, I hope that's helpful. I, don't, I guess I don't have the perfect answer on that one. No, I think it's definitely helpful. Um, so I'm just going to ask one last question and then we'll open it up because I know we're coming close to the time for Q&A. So I wanted to know what books you've been reading or podcasts you've been listening to that talk about financial feminism intersecting with you know, social justice and sustainability and investing that you'd like to share with the audience. Perhaps not all of those all together, but just maybe some that align with a few of those. Oh, you know what? That is so good. And I should have prepped for this question because I don't, I'm, let me think of some off the top of my head. I've definitely been attending webinars. We've been doing a lot of webinars. This time really has at least democratized access to, you know, before you had to go to a conference to hear people speak. And now you really can pretty much jump on a webinar and there's so many. So um, you know what, let me send that out as a postscript uh, and I'll think of a list and get it to you. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so with that, thank you, Kristen, for answering my questions. I know I hit you with a lot of heavy ones there, but I really did enjoy this discussion. I enjoyed hearing more from your perspective. Um, so I actually want to turn it over to Layla and I want to open the floor to the audience too. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or, you know, say them out loud. Yes, thank you so much to both of you. That was, I, I could see that we could go on and on and on with this, um, but it, this has been really incredibly interesting. And I do see that there have been some uh, questions put in the chat. And I wanted to say we have, uh, we have a very wonderfully diverse audience here. We have a lot of students, um, friends of Shivani's, and we have a lot of people from our 
wider communities, both on campus and off campus. So please, um, if, if, uh, you, if you put a question in the chat, you, this is a time you can ask and anybody else um, just, just grab, uh, unmute yourself and, and ask. So I see one that we can start with, um, Angelica maybe, Angelica. Um, so it, you know, sometimes it's hard to see the direct ripples of our actions and yet we really feel them and see them. And so one way that's pretty direct is your banking. So if you're banking at one of our large institutions that is financing um, some of our fossil fuel projects um, across the nation, that's basically how our fossil fuel companies um, and governments get to do all this financing is through the ones. And so one of the places you can look up to get a, a scorecard for your bank is um, Rainforest Action Network, and I can put that in the chat, does a really um, fabulous report card every year. And so you can look up and they give your bank a, a score, um, just A through F, on whether it's coal, whether it's pipelines, whether it's fossil fuels. And so um, why I mention this when we're talking about financial feminism is, you know, our, our you know, our mother earth is needing our attention and the banking um, also has probably some of our largest inequalities. The bank CEOs um, in corporate America make, you know, this many millions of dollars and their incentives and bonuses um, and shareholders, all of that is so huge. And bank tellers are often um, people that are on financial assistance from the government because they're making so little. So within their own structure, um, there's a lot of inequalities. So moving your money from one of our larger institutions and just, you know, some of the ones that end up getting a lot of attention from Rainforest Action Network because their practices are um, so misaligned are um, JP Morgan, um, you know, Chase, um, Wells Fargo, et cetera. You know, so you can look up and see how your bank is doing. What you won't find on that list are our local banks because by definition, and I said this earlier, their mission is to keep the money locally and to loan it to both individuals and small businesses locally. So the impact of doing that um, is pretty significant. Another one, I'll just put this one in the chat, is um, My C Note. Um, and that is um, an organization that uh, has a tech solution so that you're actually investing across America in, and you can again choose women owned businesses. So getting your money out of financing huge international projects and into our local communities. Um, Hopefully you can actually see and feel that a little bit. Some of this is a little bit uh, tangential. Another thing is writing for yourself or for your organization an investment policy statement. So an IPS um, and what you can do there is really just put your values in and oftentimes your values are actually translating into some really smart investment um, criteria. So um, one of ours is we invest only into diverse led teams. Um, that can eliminate up to um, about 50% of the companies you're looking at um, and you end up with better results. So you can put your financial feminism into, you know, I want to see two to three, um, you know, board seats that are, um, diverse or, or whatever. So you can make your own criteria and kind of think about it that way. You can also look at products and services and say you're only going to invest in those companies that have products and services that are good for the planet. And that's what we do at NIA. So there's a few little things um, to get you started. Fantastic, Kristen. It's Julie jumping in. Would it be helpful if I jumped into the chat and asked some questions or called on people? I know we have another question for June yeah. Marie. June Marie, are you there? Oh, or I'll go ahead and read it. Um, so she, oh, wait, more questions coming in my, my chat. Sorry, I was on mute. Oh, that's okay. Would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Um, Sure. I just, I wanted to understand better how you're focused on the structural and systemic change that underlies so much of this and, you know, going beyond impact investing to actually transforming the way that, you know, our economic systems work. Okay. So that's a big one. And um, 
I think the reason that I'm working at impact investing is because I see that as a pathway to transform our systems. And how does that happen? So it's not um, a direct connect the dots, but there's a few different levers that, that we play at NIA to connect people. So one of the things that we do as a primary lever of change is to provide a product that is so transparent and our intention is that it's really easy to understand so that we empower more people to enter into investing. So um, particularly women and people of color that have traditionally been left out due to um, some of the patriarchy that we're living in. Um, there's actually research that says that um, advisors don't give women the same kind of advice and they don't give the smart advice to women. Um, oftentimes, and sometimes this is out of really good intentions and yet um, sometimes there's just, you know, flat out mansplaining, but other times um, it's really about the, you know, oh, we've got this, you know, and this vocabulary is kind of too much for you and what are asset classes and, um, you know, and diversification or, you know, modern portfolio theory. And so we're just going to kind of do this over here. And so women do get left out of the conversation. So our intention is to bring them in. So that's the money doula blog. And then also having a really transparent and easy to understand portfolio. We cap it at 50 companies because we really want to empower investors to own what they own. Um, with the concept that if you own what you own and you're so very proud of what you own, you'll then direct more money towards the things that you're proud of. And if we have everybody directing the money out of what I was calling before kind of our passive economy with um, all of these passive indexes where no one's really driving that ship into concentrated actively managed portfolios where people are driving that ship really consciously towards the solutions. I think that's gonna be something that, that's gonna be really important because then in that investment policy statement, we can say, we're only going to invest into those companies that have fair practices that offer generous family leave because generous family leave is associated with women advancing into leadership positions. You know, we're going to only invest into those asset managers that are working on these issues with their companies. You know, so there's once, I guess we at NIA feel that we can help empower women to be directing their money so that everybody's directing their money in these, what we're calling smart investing ways, we do think we have a lever into changing the economy. Thank you. That's audacious, I know. We need each one of you to be part of this with us. Jane uh, Waxman, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Sure, I'll ask my question. This, this I will say, has very, been very interesting and thought-provoking, for sure. Um, so I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I feel like there's been a, a huge push over the years to really get women out there and in California, you know, get women on boards and all of that. Do you feel like there's going to be a, a quick flip now to move that to a, diverse, to a diversity hire and getting diversity in boards and in positions and push kind of the women back a little bit? Or... I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Um, well, with this current political environment, anything is fair game and possible. And, you know, October surprises is real. So, so um, you do have your um, senator from Santa Barbara who helped to write that. And then Nia, we were very um, involved in that dialogue and getting that over the finish line with our governor. And so um, what we're talking about for those that weren't following that is um, SB 826, which um, California led um, as far as having companies that IPO and that are publicly traded in California are required to have at least one female board member. So it's the first in the US. And then depending on size, there's two and three, depending on how large the board is. And what I'm seeing from that is, you know, be careful what you ask for, because um, we now, you know, we put our um, you know, our neck out in that race, say, and in that change. And so we are now known that we, when companies are IPOing, they are scrambling to find a woman because they can't IPO in time without that. And so they're coming to us to say, help us get a board member. And so we're actually never anticipated that we would be brokering these deals, but we're, you know, keeping a binder full of women so that we can send them um, to these companies that are IPOing. We're seeing that change. I think that 
particularly this year in 2020 with our attention to Black Lives Matter, um, it's the smartest thing for any company to be you know, inclusive from the top right now. And the smart CEOs are seeing that. Will there be a pushback on women? Um, we're not seeing that yet. We are seeing that the sought after black women are needed everywhere and they're spread too thin. You know, and so that, and that's, then there's real exhaust and fatigue happening there. Um, and so um, maybe some of you followed, it was maybe last week or the week before that the CEO of Wells Fargo put out a statement saying, you know, we want to hire, but you know, there, there isn't anybody out there. It's really a network problem and not a pipeline problem. And so to the extent that we at NIA can play a piece in helping expand people's networks, we're trying to do that. Um, and then just want to highlight the, the another action step people can take is proxy voting. And so we vote all proxies in house at NIA and we vote, well, we only invest in those companies that have diverse boards and then we push them to be better and encourage them and invite them more of a carrot than a stick kind of thing. Um, but every investor can be voting their proxies and just saying no to boards that are unbalanced. Um, and that's what, another way we can help do this. Um, if it's okay, I'd also like to add that when it comes to both diversity hiring and focusing on hiring women, I don't think it should necessarily be seen as one pitted against another. I think with both diversity and feminism, they actually work in tandem. And we're seeing that, especially now with the third wave of feminism, we're seeing a lot of talks about intersectionality and talking about how, you know, being, for example, Black women in America, it's not just about being a woman, right? It's also about your color and how that plays a part into your role, how that plays a part into your hiring process. So um, personally, from my perspective, I don't think by any means um, the need for companies to diversify their employees will be a setback for women. I think actually it will encapsulate a larger portion of women. It's not just looking at, you know, women and that's it. It's looking at if you're a brown woman, how does like this affects you if you're a black woman, if you're, you know, different, does that kind of make sense when I'm saying it's looking at different parts of you and how that works and how that plays into the hiring process? Absolutely. And we are actually putting out a best practices on hiring because so many of our companies are asking for it and we're advocating. So, um, you know, being able to think about recruitment um, the hiring process itself being transparent. Um, we actually did, um, NIA is Gen Certified Gender Equity Now. And in getting that certification, we learned so many fun facts about um, what practices lead to gender equality in the workplace. And um, there are six pillars of gender equity, uh, according to the research. And this, that's most of their research is based out of um, University of Washington in Seattle. And um, some of the things are that um, you're much more likely to end up with diverse candidates if the transparency in the hiring process is available. And so we do that on our end and then we coach other firms on how they can do that. So there's all sorts of things then also about, of course, retention. Um, and that comes from building a positive company culture with fair practices. And so we're, we're working along this system there. Great, thank you. Professor Boris, would you like to jump in and ask your question, please? Oh, well, thank you. This was a fascinating talk and you're doing just amazing work. And I wonder if you could distinguish financial feminism from other kinds of feminisms that we've heard a lot about in recent years, like lean-in feminism or the more traditional uh, equal rights feminism that we associate often with the word liberal feminism coming out of an earlier generation. Oh, I appreciate the question. Absolutely. And so, um, so the lean in feminism, um, of course, it's always up to us, you know, to do this. And yet what for me is missing in that analysis is lean into what? Right. And so lean into the status quo that was not built for us and, you know, isn't meant for us and was is never going to include us that that sounds like a, um, you know, not maybe the most effective way to do this. Right. And so I would say um, 
leaning in with and who, who are we with? And, and again, I am, you know, th this sounds crazy, but I'm finding this happens one conversation at a time. And so how can we also make this old system that really, if we look at it, isn't working for anybody, how can we make this new thing um, and this way of being and way of relating and way of sharing power and responsibility, how can we make it inviting enough that the old system isn't really relevant anymore? And so then, um, of course, I want all of our women to be empowered with the skills and how to get, you know, grab that extra seat when there isn't a seat there and whatever. And yet, I really want the system to recognize that including women is an asset to everybody, you know, and so, um, so I guess I'm more at that systems change level than at that individual lean. And I also know it's just the nature of the patriarchy. And I know I'm not saying anything that anyone on this call doesn't know, but we're definitely, the patriarchy has women questioning themselves as individuals. So if we go to lean in and it doesn't work, instead of us saying, wow, the system is messed up, we're each saying, oh, what did I do wrong? And wasn't my hair? And maybe I didn't have the power suit on, or maybe I didn't have the da-da-da. No, women traditionally do do all their homework. And so it really is the system. And so I just want to make sure that no one's going it alone. Um, there's actually an organization in New York that has break up with your bank parties. And the reason they do this, or at least the reason I find it so effective is that, and this is pre COVID time, so I'm not actually sure how they're doing it now. Um, but you get your girlfriends to go with you. And so instead of going to try to have a conversation with your bank about why you're breaking up with them, um, where you might get mansplained or just patriarchy ish in your bank, you take all your friends and they're really clear. And so you're going with your people. They have pink t-shirts about your break up with your bank party and they bring cupcakes. So they make it fun. They make it at any rate. So there is a power in number. So I hope that this is addressing a little bit about what you're talking about is just really changing this to make, make it work for everybody. Well, thank you uh, for, uh, emphasizing the systemic rather than the individual but by trying to give individuals tools there was one of the students who had another another systemic question that maybe julie can find in the chat that might be good to um, ask uh, about racism and capitalism one of the students from anya do i have that right anya yeah, Anya actually messaged me. She had class, um, but I can read it out for her as well if you want. Great, she yes, says, please. Ibram X. Kendi calls racism and capitalism the conjoined twins. So how do you balance trying to make racial justice slash equity while working within a capitalist system that he says created and perpetuates racism? So right there by calling it out, right? So we have to call out all of these things. And then, you know, again, this is happening at the systemic level. Um, it's also happening at the individual level and who makes up institutions, individuals. So it's definitely an institutional thing. We have institutionalized racism in all of our largest institutions. So if we're thinking about it at the government level, we're thinking about um, the economic level and then our educational system. So I would say those are our three largest systems. We have um, racism baked into all of those. Um, and yet, how, who makes up institutions are individuals. And so um, may we all be empowered. What we do in corporate America with our conversations is we invite them to do anti-bias work and anti-bias training. Um, and some of them, actually quite a few of them are taking on our encouragement and working with some of the groups that we're um, encouraging. One is the Mosaic Project out of Oakland, California, that does actually fabulous trainings, both um, pre-COVID and then they've moved them online. Um, and then again, I mentioned the Gender Equity Now certification program and not um, not that, so it's, it's, that one is organized around gender and yet really bringing that lens to look at all of your practices, you can actually bring a racial lens as well. Um, and it does take some curiosity and it takes some will. And I think there's something about with capitalism, um, how can we make it a win-win because there is that underlying profits and yet I think we're able to do it a little bit on the climate change size about that 
companies that are extracting from our earth, now that we know that the earth actually has limited resources, most of our, um, our economic theory and our investing theory were actually written at a time when um, the people writing them at least believed that we lived on a planet with infinite resources. And so our financial returns could also be infinite and they were, they were correlated and based. So now, you know, 50 years later where we're actually, most of us are recognizing that our planet has infinite, or excuse me, has limited resources. Those companies that are able to work with renewable resources, um, sustainable and regenerative in their economic models, we're seeing are gonna do better. So similarly with racism, that's a very extractive model. We're just, it's so baked into our status quo that we extract from communities that really just already have nothing. So we need to bring that lens to how we're thinking about our economic decisions. How can we be additive? Um, how can we be sustainable? How can we be also, um, I guess, in relation with each other as opposed to extracting? And I'll just give one example of how we think about that at NIA is where do employees and staff sit on a balance sheet? And so are you on the side of, this is a cost to the company, um, and it's something that on the balance sheet that you need to pay every quarter, every month, every two weeks, or is it sitting on the asset side and are people actually seen as an asset and are employees seen as something that you would invest into? And so that, those are some of the ways we can take racism into our system and build in um, processes that aren't as extractive. And of course, we could talk about this for five days or, you know, we can do we could do a whole class on this and I'd love to do a whole class on this. And so these are my apologies if these are short and um, I do think about this almost all day long all the time and would be happy to talk more. That, that's a really deep question and I, I hope I did it a little bit of service. Thank you, Kristen. RT, would you like to unmute and ask your question? I know we're, we're coming to the close of our time, but we want to make sure. You so Kristen, I'll first start by congratulating you. I thought I'm liberal. I thought I'm informed. But today's talk, I just wish I had a source list for everything you've been speaking, because I think I need to do so much homework. And I think generationally, we're at the same space, but you are so ahead. So congratulations. I'm just blown. And uh, my question, I think I was focusing so much. Give me one sec. So um, I'm hearing of how Nia is working in a space in finance. And like you said, you don't want to make money thoughtlessly. So it looks that it is um, the company's not only sustaining, but thriving. And then you were talking about play, uh, placing executives in boards uh, when companies are going IPO and stuff. So I think you are making Nia's presence known for what you do best. Do you see Nia's role in the future or now as a policymaker and an advocate, maybe almost lo lobbying at a federal level for uh, feminism, women's rights, uh, gender equity and equality and more? That's my main question. Okay, yeah, I saw that question. It's such a good question. So I definitely want our voice to be heard where it's relevant and where it's effective. Um, and to the extent we can empower our investors to be those voices, that would be a great place for change. Um, I never really anticipated in this work, I guess every day it unfolds in a different way. Um, and so right now, because of the conversations with, um, Okay, then let me just back up to say who is who is federal because I think we used to think about that as kind of Washington DC and maybe senators and maybe lawmakers. I have to also say that because we're talking about capitalism and financial futures, corporate America makes a lot of decisions. And so I would say we're actually playing at that level in a way that I didn't anticipate before. And so if we can change policies and practices within corporate America, um, one of those is where do they spend their money? And so, um, you know, of course, corporations, as we all know, you know, they, they get big tax cuts and they've had quite a bit of cash on their hands to make decisions. Where they're spending that um, is a big piece of it, but also are they making inclusive work workplace practices. Um, one of the things um, when you talk about um, federal, um, I guess, ways we can play, 
um, or where we can have our voice known, um, you know, since um, the um, really horrible death a couple weeks ago of one of uh, my greatest heroes, um, the, we're, we're at a place where laws could significantly change when, when and if the um, Supreme Court has a, has a different um, number and makeup. And so what we are doing at a policy level is talking to our corporations about how are they prepared to deal with this if um, women's health care is threatened. Um, because this is, of course, with all of our line, if we want women at the top, in the middle, and everywhere at the decision-making table, we need to have reproductive rights. And so what are our corporations going to do? And we're going to hold them to task if, um, you know, policy across the United States changes. So that's some of the places. Um, and then I think we're relevant and appropriate. We, you know, we have to see what, what does it mean to be an entity versus a government thing. So anyway, I'd love to take on that conversation further and just see what, what your thoughts are and what, where you'd like to see us. I agree because you've given it a very interesting spin uh, by saying that you can actually affect corporations because if you can manage that, that is a game changer. So yes, um, I think it's definitely, Something I would like to hear from you offline. It sounds um, big. It really sounds big. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Happy to happy to continue the discussion. Thank you, Kristen. There's a couple of questions that we would like to ask of Shivani um, to kind of take us home to finish our intergenerational dialogue. This is from Elena Anderson. Elena, are you are you available to hop off mute? or I can read it. I'll go ahead and read it. Shivani, I was at UCSB nearly 20 years ago, and even though I'm often one of the youngest people around the board table, I feel pretty out of touch with the pulse of college students. Looking at the current political and economic environment, what do you think most people are most out of touch with in understanding our next generation of graduates? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Elena. Um, I think one thing is there is a perception of my current generation, Gen Z slash millennial, um, that kind of sees us as sort of blasé. We kind of don't care. We make jokes, you know, there's things that pop up all the time in the news about kids eating Tide Pods or like, you know, we're creating a petition because they're going to get rid of TikTok. So I think there is this huge like idea that they're like, oh, you know, they seem like they care, but like, do they care about important things? Um, and I think it's important for people to understand that my generation like can care about things that are seemingly unimportant while also caring about issues. And I think a big thing in my generation is there's a big amount of anger and it's, not entirely misplaced. I think a lot of people my generation are angry about, you know, um, the huge gap in wealth. Like we see Bezos and he has a lot of money and people are angry because they're drowning in student debt. And they're like, why is this still a thing? Why are people still homeless? So I think that anger can get pushed to the side a lot in a lot of the news reports. But I don't think that anger is necessarily a bad thing. I think it leads to drive and determination and it does lead to my generation wanting to get things done. And we see that, you know, through, for example, the March for Our Lives movement with David Hogg, um, the NRA, there's talks of it being dis dissolved right now. So that's, you know, something that was unthinkable in 2016 because they had so much power. Um, I think it's the fact that my generation is kind of willing to sometimes make people angry to get things done. Um, and sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes maybe it's not. It's kind of like what Kristen was saying. It's also important that we listen sometimes and keep an open mind, but also at a certain extent, I think um, our generation has been looking at all these systemic issues and we are kind of along the lines of enough is enough and we will do what we need to do to get things done, I would say that's um, one thing that's important to understand. I just jump in for a, just a, a last comment and just say thank you so much for 
these incredible ideas about both of you, Shivani and, and Kristen, these incredible ideas about um, how we can bring together things that I think we often don't think about in the same in the same place. So this has been marvelous and I think we could go on and on. Thank you so much. I'll say as well, a, 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 a thank you to everyone. Uh, this has been very inspiring. Uh, it's, it's surpassed my expectations, which, which were already very high. I was very struck by how, um, as Shivani said, uh, there were no punches pulled. These were very hard and, and deep questions, and it, it created a, a, a dialogue that uh, is exactly the kind of, of engagement and, and, and thinking and promise for more um, that is so important to feminist futures. I, um, it also was, uh, we're all going to look at Money Doula and, and see how uh, this dialogue, which, which was framed as uh, uh, Shivani and Kristen also uh, there's another generational aspect of the dialogue, which is very moving to hear about, Kristen. Um, we, heard, we heard definitely a strong statement for, uh, for white males to step up and learn more, and that's clearly part of what uh, Feminist Futures is about. And, um, and I'm um, really thrilled that we've been able to model the kind of uh, uh, diverse, engaged, uh, listening to one another and and moving forward on this really basic idea that that Kristen has put forth with bring your values with you, bring your values with you to the to the work and to the to the commitments that that you have in in your career. So I want to uh, thank all of you for for being here and uh, uh, thank you, Kristen, for promising uh, to continue because we definitely need to continue these these conversations. And, and uh, Shivani, you were, you were terrific. And thank you so much for your uh, questions and insights. Uh, and um, this will definitely be continued. Have a great afternoon. <clears throat> thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Blair. Good to see you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Was it just us? <laughs>